Okay. So yeah, so in the next um, 25 minutes, I'm just going to be talking through this challenge we've been organizing, um, talking about some of the motivations, the background, and presenting our kind of results. So before I start, I wanted to kind of go back a little bit, and I'm going to talk about the first enhancement challenge and the outcomes of that and show how that's kind of evolved into the second challenge. I'll then be kind of overviewing the second challenge, which is the one uh, we're currently running and is now finished. And then we'll look at some of the systems and the results and some conclusions. So the idea of these parity challenges is to stimulate novel approaches to hearing a signal processing, particularly for speech and noise. So we're interested in speech and noisy environments and increasing the intelligibility for listeners. So the data um, that we provide to listeners is actually simulated hearing aid inputs. So we provide um, hearing aid inputs for six channel hearing aids for kind of these target speech and noise scenes. And then the task that the listeners have to perform is to um, provide the hearing aid signal processing to increase the intelligibility of the target speaker. And we also ask people to do this in a kind of um, online low latency manner. And then when it comes to evaluation, we're using both objective intelligibility measures and we're using listening tests with real um, hearing impaired listeners. So that's kind of the, the challenge set up. So then we've been, um, we're going to organize three rounds of this challenge. So last year we ran the first round and the idea is to kind of, as the rounds go on, to increase the complexity of the challenge through the rounds. So in the first round, we had these very simple stationary scenes, uh, domestic living rooms, there was a single speech target, a single um, competing so uh, noise source interferer, which was either going to be a speech source or a domestic noise. Then in CAC 2, we've made that more complicated with multiple noise sources. And in CAC 3, we're going to next year have these kind of fully dynamic scenes and a mixture of real and simulated test data. So I just want to look a bit about CAC 1 and see the limitations of that and then show how we've kind of fixed some of those problems in CAC 2 and made things more challenging. So in CAC 1, we had this kind of scenario where someone was speaking to a listener and there was an interfering um, sound source in the same room. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about CAC 1 because a lot of the stuff in CAC 1 has stayed the same. And then I can kind of highlight the differences when I come to talk about CAC 2. So we had this target talker and the interfering noise source, which is either a speech source or a domestic noise source, such as a kettle or washing machine or a dishwasher or something like this. Then what we did is we simulated um, these scenes um, using the Raven Room Acoustic Simulator. So this allowed us to generate um, 10,000 spatial configurations where we simulated the impulse responses. Um, these are all based on kind of broadly on the statistics of British living rooms. So these are cuboid rooms, but we put sort of features in to represent doors, windows and rugs by using kind of patches on the walls and floors with different surface absorptions. And then we use the Oldenburg um, HRTF database where they got recordings of HRTFs for these behind the ear hearing aids, which have a front, mid and rear microphone. So you've got um, three channels on each side, six channels altogether. So using this, we can then simulate the hearing aid inputs um, for these acoustic scenes. So the target speech, which is going to be the same in KEC1 and KEC2, is um, been designed to be suitable for intelligibility testing. So when it comes down to listener testing, what we're going to be doing is we're going to play these sentences after they've been processed to hearing impaired listeners, and they're going to have to try and repeat what they hear. So for that to work, we need quite simple sentences that are easy to remember, easy to repeat. So we use these seven to 10 word sentences. They've been sourced from the British National Corpus, um, and they use common words, and they've been kind of filtered to check that they are kind of suitable for grammar and content. And then they were recorded um, last year by 40 voice actors um, reading 250 sentences each. So we've got this nice set of 10,000 sentences that we can use both for the objective and for the subjective testing. So then in CAC1 and again in CAC2, we develop um, training and development data, which is given to participants to train these enhancement systems on and then evaluation data. So in the training data, people are going to be given the hearing aid inputs, but they're also going to be given the individual interferer um, sources and target sources. And in KEC1, the binaural room impulse responses and the full scene 
uh, metadata. So basically given everything they need to reconstruct the scene and to reconstruct the signals at the hearing aids. So this allows people to kind of learn the mapping of the noisy um, hearing aid inputs to um, the kind of anechoic target speech uh, reference signal. So we provided 6,000 scenes for training and 2,500 scenes for um, development test sets, which um, participants could use during the challenge running period to develop their systems. Then when it comes to evaluation, there's 1,500 unseen scenes, which are different rooms, different speakers, um, different interferers, obviously different sentences. And at this point, only the hearing aid inputs are, are provided. So the participants have to take the hearing aid inputs. And crucially, they're also given um, an audiogram for a listener. So on the listening tests, each scene is going to be paired with a listener on the listening panel with a specific hearing impairment. And the entrants are asked to um, process that scene for that specific listener. So they're given the scene and the matching audiogram. The entrants then do the processing and they send us back the, the process signals. Once we receive the process signals, we can compute the objective score because we've got the references. So we've got the clean speech reference, which allows us to compute this um, intrusive um, intelligibility metrics. And then we also uh, take the best systems onto the listening panel where they're evaluated through uh, listening tests. OK. The listening tests are done um, using a little platform we've got called Listen at Home. So the um, hearing impaired listeners will be listening to the process signals um, over headphones on a tablet. And what they do is they listen to the process signal. They're told to repeat the target talker. So they don't type anything. They just kind of repeat what they hear. The tablet records what they say, and that's sent back to our servers. And then we can transcribe that and score it. When it comes to the scoring, um, so there's a spoken response by the uh, person taking the test. We can then get a text transcription. We can then align the text transcription to the, um, uh, the transcription or the prompt, the actual sentence that was spoken. Um, we can align these and then we can score it. And the scoring metric we are using is the percentage words correct after alignment um, in the sentence. So as an example, if the target was something like she did not return to land again, and the person repeated he did not return to the land, after alignment, you can see that one, two, three, four, five words line up. There's seven words in the target, so that's five out of seven correct. So that sentence will be scored at 71%. When it comes to the transcription, um, we initially do that using ASR techniques because it's very quick and we can turn around things very quickly. Um, we then do a more careful transcription using human transcribers. I'll be speaking a bit more about that when I come to the results. So just um, to look at KEC1 before I move on to KEC2, I mean, what we saw in KEC1 was, you know, um, a variety of approaches and basically systems splitting up into three distinct parts, a kind of beam forming front end, um, some sort of deep neural network noise removal, and then some hearing loss um, compensation. And what we kind of found in KEC1 was actually, if you used a fairly conventional, um, a fairly conventional beamformer, so something like MVDR or LCMP, you could actually do very well. Um, and, and in fact, you know, the system here with the very best score is not even using a kind of DNN noise removal stage. Um, the hearing loss compensation actually wasn't so crucial once you've actually cleaned the signal, as long as you kind of amplify it uh, in a kind of sensible way, you could get quite good um, listening scores. And we saw we got kind of HASPI scores ranging from about kind of um, the baseline system, which is basically just doing amplification, is scoring about 1.18. Um, all systems doing some beamforming or noise removal obviously beat that by some margin. Um, HASPI scores up to about 0.7. Um, and listening test scores of um, up to kind of 86% of the words correct. These results I'm showing here just for the speech and noise condition, because this is kind of most analogous to the KEC2 results. 
And this was done over a range of SNRs from minus 6 dB to about plus 6 dB. Okay, so yeah, so in Kekron, we saw the best systems were able to get very clean understood signals down to quite low SNRs. Um, the HASPI scores were improved over the baseline, but HASPI was seen to be quite a poor predictor of listening performance among the best systems. So if you're getting a HASPI score of, a, you know, of about 0.6 and above, you're going to do well, but the correlation between the high HASPI score systems and the listing test was actually quite weak. Um, there was a speech and speech task and a speech and noise task. The speech and speech task tended to be, turned out to be kind of challenging, um, but for reasons we didn't fully anticipate, which are mostly to do with confusion about what the target talker is. So we were asking people to repeat the um, speaker that starts second. Um, some of the systems are so good at removing the interferer speaker that, that you could only actually hear one, <laughs> one speech source and this confused a lot of listeners. So we've had to kind of rethink a little bit in Keck 2 how we're going to actually do this. And I'll speak about that in a minute. Um, yeah, and there were small but significant differences between the top systems and listening tests. But the general, the general kind of conclusion after it was that in many ways the task was too easy. And by that, I mean the systems were, or the scenes were too simple. They were kind of amenable to beamforming in ways that um, real scenes and real scenarios would not be. So this is something we wanted to fix in the new challenge. So then let's move on to look at how we've evolved this into the second challenge. So the key differences in Keck 2 are now, rather than having one interferer, we have um, all the scenes have either two or three interferers. Um, whereas in Keck 1, interferers were either um, speech or music, we now have any combination of, sorry, speech or noise, we have now any combination of speech, noise, and music. We've also introduced a um, listener head turn so that after the um, in, uh, target speaker starts talking, the listener will turn their head um, towards that speaker. We've added more variability into the target onset time. In Keck 1, the target always onset at a very predictable time after the start of the utterance, which gave a very strong, strong cue for people trying to do um, speech separation. Um, so there's more variability in the onset time. Uh, and also now um, the target speaker is identified by familiarity. So what we do is we have four clean target speech utterances for the target speaker. Um, so the systems doing the enhancement have said, here's some examples of the target speaker. This is the speech you're meant to be enhancing. And again, in the listening tests, the listeners actually listen to these clean speech targets before they listen to the process scenes. So they know which voice in the mixture they're meant to be listening to. Because the way it's randomized, not every scene is going to have a competing um, speech source. And often it's quite obvious which competing speech source is because it's kind of more in the background. It starts earlier. It's generally not um, the one in front of the, um, the listener. So there's actually quite a few cues you can use to actually separate the target speech from um, interfering speeches. And then, um, We've also increased the range of SNRs. So we go down to minus 12 dB um, SNR up to 6 dB. Just to note, this is a kind of binaural task. Um, when we talk about SNRs, we're talking about the better ear SNR. So all SNRs are computed in, um, in both ears. And we talk about the SNR where there's the most favorable, uh, the most favorable ear. OK. So I'll play some examples of these scenes, but what you'll see is that kind of below zero dB, I mean, the intelligibility of the unprocessed signals is low, even for normal hearing listeners. So again, we use Raven to do the simulation, but this time we use six order ambisonic impulse responses. And by using ambisonic impulse responses, we can effectively turn the listener's head. We can kind of do this by rotating all the sources around the listener, um, which is equivalent to kind of making a rotation of the listener's head. So the listener starts off turned away from the source up to sort of 25 degrees plus or minus five degrees away from the source. And then in a window, either slightly before or up to sometime slightly after the target starts speaking, they will move their head and they'll make a movement which takes about 200 milliseconds with a standard deviation of plus or minus 10 milliseconds. And they'll end up pointing roughly towards the, um, the target speaker. So all this behavior is kind of loosely based on, on real listener behavior. I'm now going to try and play some 
from minus from 4 dB down to minus 11 dB. So this is meant to be an example at 4 dB. Today I bought the album of the year. His younger cousin launched. Okay. Um, Today I bought the album of the year. So hopefully you heard the second speaker came in. Today I heard the, I bought the album of the year, and it was reasonably well, clear. Um, this one's now at two dB. So the interferers are speech and a washing machine. Would cause the complete annihilation. I was the, the only one hadn't understood. Messages from Freya. Okay, so that second voice was the um, was the voice you meant to be listening to. I was the only one who hadn't understood. Now more difficult examples coming down to minus one dB. So now a speech, mu music, and dishwasher interferer. And coming back, seventeenth of November, I only started drinking wine, and I love the actual champagne. primary rainbow observed is set to be. So there's a kind of female voice coming in second that she should have heard. I only drink wine, and I love champagne. And now getting really challenging. This is kind of minus eight dB. Okay. Target was this. How can I ever escape from it? How can I ever escape from it? I'm just going to play the game. You listen really carefully for that second voice. And this is about as hard as it gets at minus 11 dB. And the target. The garage is going to be used as a workshop. Now just play that one again. Okay, I've got my headphones on. I can just about hear. So I think if 11 minus 11 dB, just speech detection alone becomes like a bit of a challenge. So you can see that, you know, we've got a range of um, noise levels. I mean, some of the ones that kind of 4 dB, 2 dB might be scenes that you can imagine speaking in. But to be honest, when you get down to minus 11 dB, it becomes, you know, these are not scenes you'd normally be expecting to kind of hold a conversation in, perhaps. So we're kind of coming to really extreme scenarios. So again, the training data was similar for Keck 1. We had 6,000 scenes of training, 2,500 for development data. Um, for evaluation data, we gave people the signals arriving at the six hearing aid microphones. The audiograms of the listeners shall be auditioning each process scene. Um, these four clean utterances spoken by the scene's target talker so they could learn some sort of speaker identity. And somewhat surprisingly, perhaps, you also gave the head rotation signal. So the idea here is that we asked people um, they could use a head rotation signal, but if they did so, we asked them to also provide a uh, system where they weren't using head rotation. So we kind of wanted to explore how much benefit people might gain from using that head rotation information. And the idea here being that in the future, you know, thinking forward to hearing aids that actually can use a set of and so forth to provide some, um, some idea about head movement. For training data, systems could extend the training data um, by doing data augmentation or using external data sets, as long as they also provided equivalent systems only using the official training data. So again, we wanted to see if there's any benefit from extending, um, extending the data. So all systems um, asked to respect this kind of maximum latency of five milliseconds. The listener characteristics, so these we had 20 listeners recruited, um, 17 completed and three dropped out. You can see the audiograms of the left and right ears there. So um, there's no significant difference between left and right ears. There's about kind of 40 dB deficit on average. Um, that's measured as the average um, audiometric loss at 500, 1,000, 2,000 from 4K. Um, the better ear was on average 39 dB loss, the worse ear 45 dB. Um, listeners are mostly symmetric. If you looked at the difference between their ears, on average there's a bit of 6 dB difference um, between the two ears. Okay. And you can see kind of in the high frequencies losses going up to kind of about kind of 80 dB, 90 dB. So I think these would be characterized mostly as kind of mild to moderate um, severity. We weren't able to kind of take um, severely 
impaired listeners. Um, if we have too much loss, our kind of playback system with the headphones simply can't generate enough amplification to deal with that. So we kind of limited things to be kind of up to 80 to 90 dB loss uh, at any frequency. In the listening tests, um, the evaluation was broken into kind of 10, 15 minute sessions. In each session, listeners hear just one of the systems um, on each of three different target speakers. So it goes a little bit like they hear a couple of clean target speaker examples to identify the target speaker and to get familiar with their voice. They then hear a couple of highest NAR scenes as kind of practice examples. And then they hear a sequence of 10 samples from the evaluation set, which they're going to listen to. Um, they hear the stimulus and they're meant to repeat what the target said. And obviously listeners never hear the same utterance twice uh, and they hear an equal amount of each system. That thing about never hearing the same utterance twice, obviously we don't want any memory effects. If they heard a sentence before, we can't use that sentence again later in testing. Okay, so I'm now come to the, the systems and the results. So we had 13 systems submitted from seven teams. Um, multiple, syst multiple systems were allowed where teams had trained either with or without data augmentation or with or without head rotation. Also, a couple of system teams submitted quite different entries and we allowed them in because we had a kind of capacity for 10 systems to be um, evaluated on the listening panel. Um, all teams submitted technical papers, which were reviewed to check for compliance with our rules, and all the submiss submissions were um, deemed to be compliant. And 10 systems were submitted to the listening experiments, um, including one from each team. We found in the objective evaluation that, um, that the enhancements were actually very good and the signals we were getting were very high quality. So when we came to do listening tests, we actually changed the range of SNRs a little bit. Rather than using minus 12 dB to 6 dB, we decided to go from minus 12 dB to 2 dB. So the listeners were listening to more difficult stuff and we didn't waste listeners time listening to highly intelligible signals. Um, so here is a quick summary of the of the systems. Um, there's seven teams. You can see the team identity on the left. I'm not giving the names of teams at this point. Later on, we will reveal prizes and we'll attach um, names to teams. But as we go for the day, teams will be presenting their systems and you'll be able to see which teams um, did what. We've kind of broken this down into the type of enhancement they used. Most people are using some um, multi-channel deep network um, noise reduction technique and the amplification stage that people used. And again, people using, a lot of people using the kind of now R prescription amplification that came in the baseline. Um, some people using trained amplification techniques where they optimize the amount of amplification um, directly using the, the HASPI score. And then we've got um, some teams um, used speaker extraction techniques where you learn a speaker embedding of the speaker given the, um, the clean speech examples of that speaker. So we've got um, ticks in the column where you have people using speaker extraction. And then the teams using either data augmentation or, um, or head rotation information. So then just to reveal the HASPI scores, um, you can see we've got a huge range of HASPI scores from not processing the signals at all, which gives HASPI score 0.17. The baseline system doing just amplification increases that to uh, about 0.26. Uh, and then we've got systems ranging from 0.5 up to 0.8. And the very top system getting this quite astonishing score of 0.966. Um, so those HASPI scores are actually on general higher than the HASPI scores we were seeing in, in KEC1, which is one of the kind of surprising um, things to the challenge. One of the points here is that in KEC1, we weren't actually presenting HASPI as the objective measure. We were using MB STOI, um, and then we later re-evaluated things using HASPI. Whereas here we gave HASPI as the objective measure during the challenge. Um, this means teams can actually kind of optimize directly for HASPI. So all these teams are using HASPI very directly in the optimization. So the, the question then is, does kind of optimizing HASPI in this way lead to kind of positive outcomes in the listening experiments? And I'll now show the listening results. 
Just a quick note, these listening tests are, results are still somewhat provisional. Um, the listening experiments have been running over two months um, after submission, September, um, October, November. We've only just finished the last listeners. Um, we've done the ASR scoring. The ASR scoring has got a little bit of margin of error because the ASR system itself makes errors when it listens to the, the voices when people speak back. We basically need to go through these now and retranscribe um, to get more accurate results. But I wouldn't expect these results to change by more than um, you know, three or four percent. So what you can see is um, the baseline system, you know, 27 percent of the words could be recognized correctly. Um, and if you um, move, move up, we've got performances going all the way from there right up to the top system, which was scoring 93 percent. So that means 93% of the words in that range of minus 12 dB up to 2 dB could be recognized correctly. Um, if, if, you look at, if you look at the results um, for each system, and there's multiple systems, we put the best HASPI scoring version through to the listening panel. Um, the one exception here is we didn't, we decided in the end not to use the data augmentation systems because only um, one team would use data augmentation. So we kind of excluded that from listening tests. So in the listening tests, all systems are just using kind of the official training data. Um, Two minutes, John. And, and the, in the head rotation. Um, one small um, observation here is we've got one result here at 52% in the listening tests, which is surprisingly low, it's a bit of an outlier. Um, you'd think that has to be score, it'd be scoring, you know, more like kind of um, in the 60s or 70s. Did a little bit of analysis to try and see what's going on here. Um, here you can see has to be scores versus SNR for each of the teams. Um, what you see is that the kind of effect of um, SNR and has to be is kind of similar for each team. Most of these lines are quite parallel. If you look at the team that did surprisingly badly in listing tests, it's the green line, um, team E08, you'll see that it's kind of got a slightly different angle to the others. So it actually does quite poorly at the lower SNRs compared with the higher SNRs. And if you remember in listening tests, we concentrated more on the lower SNRs. So that might be one of the reasons why it's slightly underperformed in the, in the listing tests, but we need to do kind of a bit more analysis to work out what's going on there. Um, but the big observation here obviously is that this one system with the HASPI score 0.996 is also got this incredible listening performance, I mean, right down to minus 11 dB. And if you remember that example I played at minus 11 dB, so after processing, you know, people are getting 90% of the words correct. So later on in the day, we'll be hearing from that team to hear exactly how they did that. Um, so just a summary of observations to conclude. So the task is considerably more challenging than KEC1. Um, unsurprisingly, all systems made big improvements over the amplification alone baseline. The kind of multi-channel DNM based denoising approaches, which most teams used, um, led to HASPI scores in the range of kind of 0.7 to 0.8, and listener scores in the range of kind of 60% to 80% of words correct. Um, all systems kind of followed a similar trend of HASPI versus SNR performance. Um, we're seeing higher HASPI scores for than we saw in KEC1, but leading to lower listening scores. And that might be because people have kind of more aggressively um, optimized for HASPI. And um, one exceptional system of a HASPI score of kind of 0.966 and a listening test score of 93%.